<clears throat> Hello. Um, today is uh, is the day when Andrea Palladio in uh, 1580 died. He died on, on the 19th of August, this truly great architect. But he was born uh, in 1508. <clears throat> let's, uh, <clears throat> let's read a little bit about him. <clears throat> Andrea Palladio, as you can see, born on the 30th, 30th of November 1508 and died in August 1580, was an Italian Renaissance architect active in the Venetian Republic. Palladio, influenced by Roman and Greek, was influenced um, uh, by Roman and Greek architecture, primarily Vitruvius. It is, uh, is widely considered to be one of the most influential individuals in the history of architecture. While he designed churches and palaces, he was best known for country houses and villas. His teachings, summarized in the architectural treatise, the four books of architecture, gained him wide recognition and uh, I would say deserved recognition. He was truly, truly a great architect. So again, born in November 30th, 1508. So that's 515 uh, uh, years ago, 515 years ago, Palladio was born and died in 1580. That is 443 years ago. The city of Vicenza, with its 23 buildings designed by Palladio and 24 Palladian villas of the Veneto, are listed by UNESCO as part of a World Heritage Site named City of Vicenza and the Palladian villas of the Veneto. The churches of Palladio are to be found within the Venice and its Lagoon UNESCO World Heritage Site. This was the man, apparently. Um, uh, yeah, although this uh, painting by El Greco was named uh, Portrait of a Man, I think, but uh, the experts think that this was uh, Andrea Palladio. Uh, his name was actually different. He was named by his uh, uh, protector from uh, the name Palladio is derived from uh, Athena Palace. Uh, I guess he was as a young man or shows, shows some signs of, of, of wisdom. Anyway, uh, this, uh, it's hard to, not to be emotional when you talk about Andrea Palladio. Some drawings by him from uh, you know, various uh, sources, but mainly from uh, the four books on architecture that he published. And uh, I love his drawings. He doesn't use perspectival drawings. He doesn't use perspective. And this is very interesting because this time, at his time, perspective was already invented by Piero della Francesca and Filippo Brunelleschi 150 years earlier. And yet Palladio didn't use, I never saw uh, uh, drawing in perspective or a perspectival drawing by this great architect. He only employed Euclidean means two-dimensional drawings, orthogonal drawings. That's it. And he was he was Andrea Palladio. What else can we say? Uh, so this should give us some uh, some uh, provocative, uh, uh, you know, uh, reason to think a little bit about what what it means to draw in architecture. I might even say, do we really need perspective? Because the problem with perspective is this, from my point of view. Perspective came on the human scene, the European scene, after the Middle Ages, after the Gothic times. And it was a, a way of controlling uh, representation through uh, so-called scientific means, through reason. But it is exactly this. Um, the logical, rational, maybe excessively rational, controlling uh, way of, of uh, representing, in this case, an architectural uh, entity that I think is problematic today, because we remove the subjectivity on which perceptions take place, uh, uh, the subjectivity which uh, made, for example, the, uh, the architects um, uh, or those who represented architecture in the Middle Ages ignore completely the so-called uh, objective uh, 
uh, you know, uh, ways of, of, of representation. And for example, uh, before the Renaissance, if let's say a painter or a draftsperson or an architect, although the architect officially was born with Alberti, uh, but uh, there were of course uh, architects and great architects during the Middle Ages as well, but not identified uh, officially as architects, maybe as master builders, the great builders of the Gothic cathedrals. And anyway, what I'm trying to say is at that time in the Middle Ages, uh, there was a lot of subjectivity uh, in, 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 in the ways of representing uh, reality. So for example, if you hated your neighbor and your neighbor was um, in the foreground of the, of the picture that you drew, you made him small. But if you loved someone who was very far away in the picture, you made her or him very big because it was about the importance of that someone or the displeasure of representing someone else that dictated the size of the of the of the uh, you know the of, of the character in the picture that you created. You say it's nonsense because it's not objective. But life itself is not totally objective. Subjectivity exists. So the mental dimension is important too. So I think it makes sense. If you like, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, Le Cabanon by Le Corbusier, which is very small. No, it's about 60 square meters. And uh, you dislike, uh, let's say, a communist block of flats, uh, 10 floors high and long. The medieval man would have drawn the Le Cabanon by the Corbusier very big because he liked it and would have drawn the block of flats built by, let's say, Ceausescu very small because he disliked it. So there is some reason in the subjectivity or the unreason, the irrationality of, uh, uh, you know, uh, pre-Renaissance representation. But coming back to Palladio and look here on the left is the beautiful uh, drawing he made with Il Tempieto by Bramante in Rome. Uh, I, I, I love this half elevation, far half section uh, by Palladio. Uh, so coming back to Palladio, I wonder, and I do not know the answer, why is it he didn't, he didn't have uh, our beloved uh, kind of renderings, no perspectival renderings in colors with voluptuous clouds, with uh, incredible cars in front of a nonsensical building, you know, call it Maserati or whatever, and then some seductive silhouettes, and you completely forget about the building. Here we don't have such a thing. We only have the reality of the building drawn very honestly and very simply. Uh, apparently, this is uh, there are some sketches here by him. Um, here I show a collage of, uh, you know, various. Uh, uh, drawings by him, again, Il Tempieto by Bramante, and I love this drawing by, uh, by Palladio, and on the right you see the plan. Uh, again, this building was built by uh, Bramante, not by Palladio, but he drew it in, in his four books uh, on architecture, or of architecture. The drawings of uh, Villa Capra, this beautiful building which uh, Goethe considered the, the ultimate uh, you know, uh, house, uh, house, 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 in, even in a cosmical sense, which is something we don't think of any longer, of course. The Pantheon. Some villas <clears throat> by him. So in 1537, he built Villa Godi, uh, um, 1537, how old was he then? Uh, I forgot exactly when it was baby, 50 on. I think he was in his early 30s when he built this building, um, Villa Godi, a large building otherwise. I don't know if all, all of these three buildings were built by him. Probably not. Maybe just this one, Villa Godi, 1537. Uh, Palladio is truly mysterious. I attended many years ago 
five lectures by Peter Reisenman at Cooper Union in New York, where he tried to decipher the, the, the mystery of the masterly works by uh, Andrea Palladio. And <laughs> I didn't understand much from Peter Reisenman's lecture, but I did understand one thing, that he, he was fascinated by Andrea Palladio. And it's true, Andrea Palladio is fascinating. Uh, I mean, his, his power to influence world architecture and his uh, endurance, no? I mean, there are almost five, five centuries since, since he lived and, and built. And his architecture is actually, it's very simple and at the same time, it's very complex. You know, you could say, oh, I understand, it is simple. I can do something like this too. But it's not easy to do something like this. And then the proof is in the, in the followers of Palladio, the Palladianism that spread all over Europe and uh, in the United States and all over the world, actually. Uh, the influence was immense. Before 15, for, uh, 1542, he built Villa Gazzotti. Uh, so 1542, this is the drawing. Villa Gazzotti. He worked with relationships, with um, with the proportions. He was a master of, 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 of proportions, and you know this is an art we cannot uh, we cannot address uh, uh, very well because we are <clears throat> consumed by uh, uh, you know the the myriad of uh, the multitude of functions that we have to address. In, in the case of these villas, I mean, you can imagine, I, I mean, I wonder, let's say Andrea Palladio had to make a, a modern restaurant, right, with a modern kitchen. My God, my God, I mean, I don't think he would have had time to, to dedicate to, you know, uh, perfect uh, harmony, uh, proportional harmony between the elements of the building, because he would, he would be consumed how to solve the um, you know, the demanding uh, technical and functional uh, uh, aspects of a modern restaurant kitchen. Uh, for example, the Villa Capra, where is the bathroom? Where is the kitchen? Where is the toilet? I don't know. But it must have had something, but that building, and not only that building, his buildings in general, they, they don't they don't dwell on, 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 on those aspects without which we suffocate and die. This is a beautiful building and maybe it's my love of ruins that likes it even more than one that is in a good shape. I, I would love to live in this building. Now, why is it in such a bad shape? So this was built in uh, uh, 15, uh, 1542, Villa Gazzotti. Vicenza. Even like this, you know, affected by the elements, I think it's very beautiful. I don't know the proportions. This is just, it's, it's a perfect building. For me, it is. And in fact, I feel like going right now to Italy to inquire if it's not possible to live in this building. It is deserted. You can see. It's, uh, how could this be? Maybe it's even for sale, and now I'm cynical, for one euro. Uh, Italians do, do sell uh, in the villages and, and, and towns, especially in the south, you know, uh, buildings for one euro. I feel, I feel like not advancing in my presentation. I feel like stopping here and looking at this picture together with you for about one hour and a half. What about that? And just look at the picture of this building without saying anything for one hour and a half.
okay, let's not be too eccentric, but I truly feel like looking at this picture at least one hour and a half. What's the magic of this building? I mean, I look at it, I understand it, it's symmetrical, it's in a way predictable, but it's beautiful. And it is not that symmetry sometimes is accused for producing that results. But, but this building is alive, even if it is, uh, you know, eroded a little bit by, by the passage of time and by the elements. It's truly beautiful. I, th I think it sings. I, th I think this building was built by Eupalinos Andrea Palladio. 1542, Villa Valmarana, 1542. Now this one is taken care of. There are even touches of, uh, I mean, you know, you see that glass there. I'm sure it was not like this when he built it. I like more the, the previous building, but this one is, um, you know, was luckier, was taken care of. Valmarana, Villa Pisani, a very important building by him, 1542. Uh, this is the back, but I, I, I like very much the drawings um, the, the, from the four books of architecture by Palladio. So it's called Villa Pisani, Pisani built between 1542 and 1545. We see sculptures now um, uh, animating uh, the top part of his buildings very often. Why is it that we don't do such things any longer? The back of the building it doesn't, uh, doesn't move me so much. 1542, Villa Tienne. I like this view more than this one, than more than this one. Yes, uh, uh, clearly the proportions are magnificent. It doesn't bother me at all that, you know, the, the, the skin of the of the facade is not, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't have uh, a makeup. It doesn't have a, you know, so-called finishes. It's fine like this. It's it's honest. It breathes. The brick breathes, and it's. I wish we could build like this again. Although, I am not favoring. Uh, you know, uh, rebirth of, uh, of the past in, uh, in its own terms, but because this is an eternal architecture, this is, yes, it was built almost 500 years ago, but, uh, uh, you know, harmonious relationships and, and uh, adequate proportions uh, transgress time. Villa Poyana, 1549. Now, you have to understand that, uh, you know, the ceiling of our apartments, uh, in our apartment buildings are, uh, start uh, somewhere, you know, at the, at, the, at the top of the door here. So the ceiling here is um, almost unacceptably tall for our, for our standards. 
Uh, but even the basement uh, has a nobility and uh, you know, character which uh, I wish we would have in um, at, um, at higher levels in our apartment buildings. But it's a different world. It's a different uh, way of living. Uh, who could afford such a villa today? Well, some do in Hollywood or uh, close to Hollywood. Villa Poyana. Again, try to imagine this building without the statues, without these three statues and these two here. It would be the same building, yet something would be missing. Even Arata Isozaki, the celebrated Japanese architect who died uh, not too long ago, was influenced by Andrea Palladio when he built in Japan. What's interesting about Palladio is that while many architects practice other arts as well, painting, some sculpture, uh, some write poems, as far as I know, he only, he only did architecture. You know, and, and, and his books are on architecture. But in his case, it's not a, it's not a deficiency at all. It's, um, it's an astonishing thing that <clears throat> his architecture uh, inspired uh, very, very eloquent uh, texts uh, coming not just from architects. I mentioned Goethe. <clears throat> and yet his architecture is only architecture, if we can say something like this, only architecture. And we remember what Wolf Rick said, that if you only think of architecture, you will only get architecture. But in the case of Palladio, getting only architecture is actually getting everything. Villa Barbaro, 1554. Villa Barbaro, also known as the Villa di Maser, is a large villa at Maser in the Veneto region of northern Italy. It was designed and built by the Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio, with frescoes by Paolo Veronese and sculptures by Alessandro Vittoria for Daniele Barbaro, patriarch of Aqu Aquileia, and ambassador to Queen Elizabeth I of England and his brother, Mark Antonio. The villa was added to the list of World Heritage Sites by UNESCO in 1996, Villa Barbaro, a, one of his best works, in my opinion. I love this building, both inside and outside. It's sublime. It's rural and urban at the same time. It's um, terrestrial and cosmical or celestial. It's very beautiful. I usually don't like arches in architecture very much unless they are done by uh, Louis Kahn or from the past someone like Palladio. In the case of Palladio, arches are, are uh, proportioned in such a way that uh, they, they transcend the convenience of just using an arch because everybody does arches and so on. No, in this case, it's not a convenience. They just grow naturally from the ground and uh, they support what they are supposed to support. 
I wish there was here uh, Francesca who knew some details about this building, which I do not know. But we read that uh, important artists contributed to the building. Villa Barbaro. Again, plenty of sculptures around the building. Of course, this building was not for a proletarian, but it's not a, uh, it, it is not a, um, uh, you know, an arrogant building at all. And most of it is, uh, you know, one, one floor. And, uh, and yet, I don't know, it's, 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 it's modestly majestic if I am to, to speak so. It's truly a beautiful yes set to life, this building, and to the sun, to the sunlight. Villa Foscari, called La Malcontenta, uh, 1554. <clears throat> villa Foscari is a patrician villa in Mira, near Venice, designed by, uh, by Andrea Palladio. It is also known as La Malcontenta or the Discontented, a nickname which, according to a legend, it received when the spouse of one of the Foscaris was locked up in the house because she allegedly didn't live up to her conjugal duty. This is the legend, Villa Foscari or La Malcontenta. Now, how could one be, uh, you know, discontented, uh, you know, locked, locked up in this building. I would be more than contented to be locked up in this building. <laughs> Not for just one life, but for 10 lives or even 100 lives. Can you imagine living in this building? The prisoner of this building, a malcontenta, with some nice books around, you know, and maybe even a glass of wine, although I only drink buttermilk, but some more normal people would drink wine as well. Very nice building. Look at the sunlight. Um, uh, a most pleasant prison. And the exterior is, is equally magnificent. Look at these uh, uh, steps on both sides, you know, uh, naturally growing towards the, uh, the entrance into the building. Very, very nice. And then the, the you know, the, the very uh, asserting uh, chimneys left and right, La Malcontenta. Truly, wouldn't you be very, very happy to be imprisoned in this building? And what could be more beautiful in this life? Especially if we agree with the... Uh, uh, bless Pascal, who said that uh, all the troubles of humankind are because we cannot stand still in one room. Imagine standing still in a room in La Malcontenta. No parapets to the stairs. They were no, not needed. And they are very elegant like this, and I would say very modern. Also, what's interesting here is that you have the, you know, the classical orders, the columns above a very domestic uh, level or floor, you know, because it is rather uncommon to have that kind of, you know, this kind of modest windows underneath such tall, you know, uh, columns and, you know, kind of tri triumphant uh, uh, loggia. So I think it's a, it's a discourse here of uh, magnificence, which is um, uh, superimposed on, uh, on modesty, magnificence and modesty. This is not easy to achieve at all, but he does. I mean, Andrea Palladio. Great work. It 
true. Yeah, I, I would give away a few years of my life just to have the chance to be imprisoned in this building. Try to imagine living in such a in such a room, in such a building, opening that window. I like to imagine, to fantasize that uh, if Vladimir Putin was invited to uh, spend a few days in this building, he would have stopped immediately the war in Ukraine. The back of the building, the front of the building, La malcontenta. Bravo, Andrea Palladio. You enchant us. More than four centuries after you died. Villa Badoer, I don't know if I pronounced well, 1554-1555. Uh, it was designed in 1556 and built between 57 and 63 on the site of a medieval castle which guarded a bridge across a navigable canal. This was the first time Palladio used his fully developed temple pediment in the facade of a villa. Uh, let's see the temple pediment. Villa Badoer. For the Venetian noble Francesco Badoer. Of course, the walls were not uh, left white. I read uh, the other day uh, that uh, on, you know, on, on the web that Italy is collapsing, but maybe it is collapsing because of too much beauty. There is too much beauty on its shoulders. Villa Badoer. Villa Emo, 1556, is one of the many creations conceived. Okay, it is a patrician villa located in the Veneto region of northern Italy. The patron, patron of this villa was Leonardo Emo and remained in the hands of the Emo family until it was sold in 2004. It's part of the World Heritage Site.
<clears throat> so he died in 1580. That's exactly 443 years ago, today, on the 19th of August. Rather triumphant uh, interest. You could have uh, you could have entered the building uh, on horse. Beautifully proportioned as well. Why would we want to go to Mars when we have such beauty here on Earth? Another, another perfection from Andrea Palladio. Uh, he didn't have to uh, dwell in that uh, imperfect perfection of Lina Bobardi. Because the beauty of the buildings by Andrea Palladio are not arrogant. The perfection, if we are to use this word, is, um, uh, is modest. It's not an arrogant perfection. It's a modest perfection. And thus, a human perfection, a worm perfection. I, I, paradoxically, you could almost say an imperfect perfection exactly because it is a modest perfection. Even when he designed buildings that are, have a certain scale, I mean, you know, this is not the smallest uh, house in the world, but it's not arrogant at all. Another Villa Valmarana, we remember we saw one before, uh, 1563, but no pictures. Why is it that I don't have pictures? I was always a little bit confused because I think there are two Villa Valmarana uh, built by him. Villa Fornicerato uh, is attributed, it is attributed to Andrea Palladio and his client is assumed to have been Girolamo Forni, a wealthy wood merchant. The attribution to Palladio is partly based on stylistic grounds, although the building departs from the Palladian norms. This is the building, another building that seems to be left uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, how could this be? I, I love the abandoned buildings of Palladio even more that are, um, you know, gloriously refurbished and uh, uh, that's because of my uh, maybe almost pathological uh, love of ruins. But imagine living in a ruin by Andrea Palladio. But it's not really a ruin. It's just a little bit uh, not taken care of. That's it. The ruin is near it explicitly so, but the power of spirit still triumphs. Villa Serego uh, was built for another as aristocratic family. The villa is distinctive for its use of rusticated columns of the Ionic order. Yes, we don't see too often something like this from Palladio, the Ionic order, but uh, they are not, that it is an ionic order, but you see the columns are rusticated. So again, we see what I think Palladio is uh, uh, mastering so well, is some kind of, a, of a intertwining and intermingling of rurality and uh, let's say uh, cultured, uh, cultured, uh, uh, you know, aesthetics, like in this case, the ionic um, uh, top of the column, but the column is rusticated. So there is rurality and there is high culture at the same time. And 
in here explicitly so in other buildings less explicitly uh, but um, i think again it's about uh, uh, palladio being able to to um, to manage uh, uh, even uh, buildings with a certain uh, uh, you know uh, dimension or volume but in terms of a certain modesty and maybe the modesty is not so apparent in this building, but the fact that the columns are rusticated bring an element of rurality, if I'm allowed to say so, in play. And, and this, this um, uh, reduces the, the possibility of, 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 of arrogance, aesthetical arrogance. Now the rusticated uh, columns, you know, evoke a certain, uh, you know, primitivism, you know, rustic, rusticity. He was experimenting. He was not uh, just repeating himself uh, ad infinitum. No, he, he, he was experimenting. Villa Almerico Capra, called La Rotonda, maybe his most famous villa. Uh, so it's outside of Vicenza. Uh, the villa's correct name is Villa Almerico Capra Valmarana, but it is also no, known as La Rotonda, Villa Rotonda, Villa Capra, and Villa Almerico Capra. Maybe too many names. The name Capra derives from the Capra brothers, who completed the building after it was said, said it to, he, to them in 1592. Along with other works by Palladio, the building is conserved as part of the World Heritage Site, City of Vicenza and the Palladian Villas of the Veneto. And uh, what else can we say? It's, it's, it's the perfect house, which marries the earth with the sky. For those who want to visit it, uh, they need to get some approvals, uh, but it is possible to, to visit it. Otherwise, you are condemned to the pleasure of uh, glancing at it from, uh, from outside of the limits of the, of the site. I, I, one day uh, when I visited it, I, I, because it was closed the gate, I, I didn't make reservations. I, I photographed um, Villa Capra through the keyhole in the, you know, in the gate, the door of the, the gate that separated the, the site from uh, you know, the, the public, uh, from the road. Just imagine, no, this most famous building being photographed through a keyhole. So who said that architecture doesn't belong to art? La Rotonda, Villa Capra. This man, Andrea Palladio, was a magician. Palaces, Palazzo Porto in Vicenza.
<coughs> Palazzo del Capitaniato. I love this building. It's right across from the, um, you know, uh, from the across the square from the Basilica in Vicenza, fifteen sixty five. And who said that ornament should uh, have nothing to do with architecture? Well, uh, let's look at this building. Does it have ornament? It does, doesn't it? Would it be less without the ornament? Yes, it would be less. Maybe this is even more, uh, a little bit more ornamented than some other buildings by uh, Andrea Palladio. Vicenza. Palazzo Valmarana <laughs> in Vicenza. All these uh, works by Palladio are a part of the, the urban fabric. They are in between other buildings, uh, but it's very easy to, to discover them because there are indications very clearly stating where the buildings are. A page from the four books on architecture by Palladio with the Palazzo Valmarana in Vicenza. Palazzo Barbaran da Porto. Palazzo Porto in Piazza Castellos. Uh, this one uh, partially completed in 1615 by Vincenzo Scamozzi. I, uh, I like this building very much. So it's 1571. Maybe, maybe because I like uh, sometimes unfinished uh, buildings is this one here on the right. Narrow and tall. Look at those columns, majestic as they are, if you look at the silhouette of the human beings and then the height of the columns. Palazzo Porto, Palazzo Porto, 1571. And look at the betrayal, a slight subtle betrayal of symmetry. You know, here you have two windows, but here on the top we have this, and here on the top we have this. It's just a, a slight uh, um, deviation from uh, perfect symmetry. This is right near the train station in Vicenza. So if you go to see the Venice Biennial, you take the train to Vicenza for one hour and you have the chance to see these buildings. One near the, near the other. In half a day, you can see a good number of buildings by this truly, truly great architect. I love this picture. Palazzo Porto. Uh, Palazzo Tiene Bonilongare. 
but it was built by Scamozzi. Uh, this is the first building that you see actually on uh, on the on the avenue that uh, is uh, uh, rich in, in buildings by Palladio. It's in the corner and it was built by Scamozzi, but on the on the plans of Andrea Palladio. And actually, uh, I don't know how to describe it. This square, the opposite uh, side is uh, Palazzo Porto, the one we looked at previously. Scamozzi himself, a uh, remarkable architect. Now, church architecture by Andrea Palladio. Of course, this presentation is, um, in a way, tentative and short, but we try to pay homage to him on the day when he died, the 19th of August, 1580. The refectory of the monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore, 1560. Uh, the, the church of San Giorgio Maggiore, uh, completed uh, after Palladio's death by Scamozzi. Uh, the beauty of Venice would be less without this building. Again, the, the facade was uh, completed by uh, Scamozzi. San Giorgio Maggiore, that's how we should call it. San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice, Palladio plus Scamozzi. The interior, if I'm allowed a uh, mere mortal to say something, uh, um, you know, not quite uh, uh, positive, uh, which I know is, uh, is uh, perhaps an impertinence from me, but I find the interiors of his church is a little, for my taste, a little bit too whitish, too, I wonder what his uh, religiosity was. You know, I mean, not the official face, but because I think the interior is, uh, yeah, it's a little bit too luminous and uh, I don't know very well how to, to say it. It, it. The interior of a church, for my taste, should have some something uh, liminal or something uh, um, you know, mysterious, a certain ambiguity in the play between light and shadow. And here I don't see too much of that. It's a little bit too, too, too much clarity for my taste within the building. The facade was done by Scamozzi, but we see the building employs brick and so on. It's even chromatically, it's richer. I would have liked to see more contrast here between light and shadow to be somehow more dramatic or the opposite, more serene, it's, but who knows, who knows, uh, maybe it was uh, in time uh, also uh, slightly transformed, although maybe not, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, why is it that um, my interpretation of the interior of San Giorgio Maggiore is uh, a little bit uh, less enthusiastic? Il Redentore, which is uh, not far away from San Giorgio Maggiore, across the water. Here it is, Il Redentore. So we saw San Giorgio Maggiore, and now we look at Il Redentore. Again, you know, uh, this uh, interior, which makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable, almost like, almost like a Unity Temple by... Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright in uh, Oak, uh, Oak Park uh, in, uh, in Chicago, uh, which is also not somehow uh, sufficient in, from my point of view, an expression of uh, ardent faith. That's why I'm curious what Andrea Palladio uh, felt vis-a-vis -vis God. 
And again, the exterior is more, uh, uh, at least chromatically, but not only chromatically, there is a richness outside which inside exists, but because of this equal treatment of the walls and the ceiling and you know all this uh, generalized whiteness, I feel something is missing. But I could be wrong. It's uh, Il Redentore, Andrea Palladio, Venice. I guess what I'm trying to say is that looking at these pictures with the interior of this church and the previous church, somehow my soul is not exalted. And if this, if a church is the house of God, then you would expect some form of exaltation. And for some reason, I am more exalted by his villas in the country than by the churches he built. This is my subjective uh, statement. The Church of Santa Maria Nova in Vicenza, a project attribute, it completed after Palladio's death in 1578, was designed, I guess, but completed in 1590. He died in 1580. This is an interesting building, actually. It might be by him. It is in Vicenza, and is not far away from a block of flats designed by Carlos Carpa. Ah, Vicenza, I miss Vicenza. This is a, more like a temple in a way. I think a little bit of Alberti here. Church of Villa Barbaro, Tempieto Barbaro, 1580. Remember, he died in 1580, so I guess it was built after his death, but designed by him at Villa Barbaro, uh, Church of Villa Barbaro. It would be interesting to compare the villas of Andrea Palladio with the churches of Andrea Palladio and to see what is the, in a way, in what way he uh, differentiated between the terrestrials and the celestial. Of course, the, the church is also built on earth by human beings, but it's destined for a different kind of client, so to speak. The supreme one, no God to build the house of God. And how, how would it be to compare the house of man or for man with the house of God or for God built by Andrea Palladio? Because with some changes, this church could have become a part, the central part of a, of a villa. Basilica Palladiana in Vicenza. Here it is.
and this is him. I mean, the statue of him. Let's say this to the students of architecture and to all the architects in the world. Strive to become a statue. I know it sounds, uh, you know, almost humoristic, but Let's be honest, who wouldn't like to be immortalized as a statue? Unfortunately, there are people in the world like Vladimir Putin who want to smash the statues and particularly the statues of culture and sensitivity with the deadly bombers. In order to gain a little more land, for the biggest country in the world in terms of land. At the base of the Basilica Palladiana, there is a market. Well, you know, temporarily uh, used. Vicenza, Basilica Palladiana. That's all. So Andrea Palladio died in 1580 on the 19th of August. And today is the 15th of August, 2023. Thank you.